Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. I'm happy to be in the house of the Lord today. Is anybody happy to be here as well? Amen. Um, we don't have much time, so I'd like to quickly get started. Um, but I'd like to give honor, first and foremost, to God for, for bringing me this far. Amen. Um, it's, it's always a privilege to be in church. It's always a privilege to preach. Um, and, and looking back at my life, I can't help but see that, that He's been merciful to me. Amen. So, so, of course, we want to honor and glorify God. And also, Pastor and, and Brother Stephen for this opportunity. Amen. Um, but today, I, I, I'm here to preach the Word of God. Amen. I'm here to preach the Word of God, if nothing else. And it, it's, it's a little daunting sometimes to be the preacher. And I used to run away from that. Amen. I used to run away from being the preacher or from doing what God wanted me to do. But uh, I'm not going to run anymore. Amen. We're here today. I'm going to preach and you guys are going to preach with me. Amen. So every time something that I say is true, I want to hear an amen. 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 Praise God. Every time I say something that's true, God is good. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. So let me tell you today, church, God wants to do something. And, and we're all ready. There's, there's, all a, there's a reason that we're all in this pew today. Amen? Amen? So he wants to do something in this church, so why don't we just let him do what he wants to do? Amen? Why don't we just let him do what he wants to do? Um, there's, there's a fight every time someone comes up here. There's a fight every time someone comes up to preach. A spiritual battle, a spiritual war. And it started... The moment we started singing, and it's just intensified right now, amen? And we think, we think that these preachings are, are, you know, routine, but there's warfare going on right now as I speak. So, I want us to, to pray real quick, and then we're going to get started, amen? Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we come before you today, giving you all the honor and all the glory, Lord Jesus. First and foremost, Lord Jesus, this is all for you. We are in your house today, Lord Jesus. We are... Lord, here to glorify you, Lord Jesus, not our will, Lord Jesus, but yours be done. Hallelujah on earth as it is in heaven, Lord Jesus, in this place, Lord. I pray today, Lord Jesus, that they would receive this word, Lord Jesus, in their spirit, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That there would be breakthrough, Lord Jesus, and I bind every spirit, Lord Jesus. Every distraction in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that there would be a spirit of liberty here, Lord Jesus, to worship you, to lift you up, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on. Go clap your hands, all you people, and shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Can anyone shout out to God? Can anyone say hallelujah today because he's been good to you? Can anyone worship God today in this place? Come on. It's 10 a.m. That doesn't mean anything. It's 10 a.m. It's time to worship. It's Sunday morning. Can someone say hallelujah today? Hallelujah. Really quickly, the title of this message is do not be conformed. I'm going to ask you to please stay standing as I read the Word of God. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Amen. A common scripture. A common scripture says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? Today, I'd like to speak to you today, and this message titled, Do Not Be Conformed. Amen? Do not be conformed. Can you guys say that with me today? Do not be conformed. Amen. You may take your seats. Praise God. I, I first heard this verse uh, in the juniors class when, when Dr. Leo Maffei, uh, he spoke it to the class. And he, he was my teacher for a couple of years. And, and I, I had this, uh, this mindset that he was pretty hard on the juniors. You know, I had this mindset like, oh my gosh, like we're just kids. And he wants us to memorize all these verses. <laughs> 
But one of the verses that he wanted us to memorize was Romans 12, 2. And I had never heard it before. And he had us memorize it. He said, And do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he had us repeat that. And he had us repeat it. And he had us repeat it. I was like, conformed, renewing, what, it, what does all this mean, you know? And I didn't really understand at the time as a junior. But as I went through high school, and as I went through my walk with God, that verse stuck with me. And everything that I did, when I would look at my friends, I would say to myself, and do not be conformed. And do not be conformed. And do not be conformed. And I remember Leo saying it, Brother Leo saying it. And I had to memorize it. And I had to use it for myself. And this is my favorite verse out of all the verses in the Bible. And do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Amen? And I want to tell you all here today, if you leave with anything, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. What does it mean to be conformed? It means to comply with rules. Don't comply with the rules of the world. Don't give in to what they want you to give in to. Don't do what your friends are doing. Don't believe the way that they believe. Don't talk the way that they talk. And I started to give in. I used to talk the way that they talked. And I used to walk the way that they walked. And, and I had a lot to repent for. Amen? We, we all do still. But God has changed me. Praise God. But, Thank you, Jesus. but I could see when I was doing the wrong that I was conforming. Because of this verse, because I learned it, I knew that I was conforming. Amen? You guys know when you're conforming. Amen? You guys know the difference between right and wrong. And I'm here to tell you today, don't give in to what they want you to give in to. Do not believe everything that they want you to believe. Do not start acting the way that they act. Don't start wearing what they wear. Amen? Sports teams wear jerseys to signify which team they're on. Amen? That's why we come to church in a suit or in a dress. I want you to know which team I'm on. I want the world to know that I'm living for God. That I'm dressing a little different. And people look at, people look at us and say, oh, how old fashioned? And why are you wearing a suit? And I went to Seder Bros one time wearing my suit and the, the cashier was like, oh, you got a business meeting? You know? I was like, no, I got out of church right now. And he looked at me a little like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, who is this guy? But, but I hope that it made an impact. That we're willing to look different for God. Amen. That we're not willing to conform. Amen? That we're not willing to conform. And we just started, but God is trying to take us somewhere right now. Amen. So I want to talk to you about not conforming. It means being separate, right? If you're not conforming to something, you're being separate from what that is. And the, and the youth were talking about sanctification last, last month for Tuesday Talks. It's a very similar topic. And we see that early on in the life of Jesus, he was separated from the world. Jesus, the ultimate example of how we should be, of what we should be. In Luke 2, verse 21, it says, And when eight days were completed, for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Jesus was circumcised. God was circumcised. What did, why? Why did God have to be circumcised? Circumcision signifies a relationship with God. It did with the Jews. You weren't you didn't have a relationship with God until you were circumcised as a man. Until you were circumcised when you were little. And some people were circumcised later on in their life because they came to God later on in their life. Amen? And we see that, that when this happened and when 
blood was shed, and when it got a little uncomfortable, then he was called Jesus. When, when the wise man came, they called him God. But no one had called him Jesus yet until he was circumcised. Until he was uncomfortable. Until there was some blood shed. This is a side note. But if you want your calling, it's going to come the same time that you're willing to be uncomfortable. If you want to be named differently, if you want your purpose to come, and you want to receive it, it's going to come once you're willing to be uncomfortable. Once you're willing to say, I want a relationship with God. If you want something greater, if you want a greater purpose, give your life to Him, and He'll give that to you. Amen? He'll give that to you. And that's why it's so difficult for some of us to work in our calling and to be made new. It's because we're not willing to sacrifice. We're not willing to shed the blood. We're not willing to pay the price. Amen? But that's an early example of how he was separated from the world early on as a baby. Later on, we see in Jesus' life that it started to get a little bit more crowded. Amen? Once his ministry started taking off and he started going throughout the lands, performing miracles, a crowd grew around him. A crowd grew around him. In Mark 11, verses 7 through 10, it says, Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen? This verse says that many spread their clothes on the road. They cut down leafy branches. And they yelled Hosanna. They were praising God. A whole crowd was around him praising him. They were all around him praising him. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew that it was going to get lonely. When there's a crowd, we have to be careful. Because that means we can conform to the crowd. There's something called a mob mentality. When people get in big groups, they do anything, and there's chaos. There's mobs, amen? Mob mentality. Be careful when you're crowded with a bunch of people, even believers. Because we see that later on, Jesus becomes lonely in the garden. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 41, it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons, sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Later on in 41, it says, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And in, in verse 43, it says, Jesus, and he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And in 45, it says, Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Three separate times where God wanted them to pray with him, but they were asleep. Three separate times where he separated himself from them. He could have gone and slept with them too. He could have gone and said, I'm tired too. But he didn't. He didn't conform to them. He didn't conform to the way that they were thinking. He didn't conform to the way that they were living. He said, something's happening and I need a break. Something's happening and I need a break right now. It doesn't matter what my friends are doing. It doesn't matter if they're comfortable. It doesn't matter how they're living. I need a break. I need to get on my knees because something is stirring up right now. Jesus came to them three times and they were asleep each time. But 
But if you look at them, they were disciples. They were not people from the crowd. These were people from church. These were his friends who he was mentoring and doing miracles with and standing with for, for three years. Yet they were asleep. What does that mean for us? That means that sometimes we can't even conform to what our brothers and sisters are doing. That means that sometimes when we're sitting here on our pew, we're conforming. In this church, there's conforming. In every church, in every crowd, there's an opportunity to conform. But Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed. And do not be conformed. What does that mean? If someone's sitting there comfortable, I got to jump up and I got to praise God because there's something different. There's something worth jumping for. There's something worth jumping for. There's something worth running for. Come on. Are we going to conform to what my brother's doing? Or am I going to stand up and I'm going to say, I'm not going to conform to this church. I'm not going to conform to my friends. I'm going to worship God. Come on. Hallelujah. These were the brothers. These men of God, his friends from church, that should have been praying with him, interceding, could not even stay awake in the most stressful period of Jesus' life. In the most stressful period, when he needed the most. They were asleep. And in verse 44 it says, So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. He left. He left them. Sometimes, yes, we must love our brother and sister, of course. But sometimes people are just going to hold you back if you're going to conform to the way that they're living. I would rather be separate than conform and not get closer to God. Is conforming worth not growing? Would you rather grow or would you rather conform? The most comfortable places sometimes are with our brothers and sisters from church. I get really comfortable when I get all my friends around. Praise God. Really comfortable. And sometimes too comfortable where things start coming out that shouldn't be. That's conforming. Amen? I need to work on conforming. We all have to work on that. Amen? Jesus had again a time where he chose to be separate. This time it was not from the typical crowd, right? But from the people in church from his brothers at the most stressful point in his life and Jesus was lonely why? because he could not be conformed because his purpose was of such a magnitude that he, he couldn't conform to the plans of any other man Jesus had such a purpose on the earth that he had to go beyond what everyone else was doing. Can I tell you today that you have such a purpose today in this life. There's such a reason that you're here. Even more so why you should not conform. Conforming will keep you back. Conforming will hold you back when God wants you to go forward. Conforming will limit you it doesn't limit God, it limits you. God has no limits. We limit him when we say, I'm going to be here and be comfortable. I'm going to be here and do what everyone else is doing. I'm going to be here and sit in this pew. I don't want to be free. I don't want to have liberty. I want to sit in this pew and not worship God. I want to come to church, but not jump. His purpose was of such a magnitude, he could not participate in the sleep. People are asleep right now, amen? in the rest that the disciples were getting. He didn't conform. He prayed. He prayed. He prayed. 
Three separate times. Three separate times. He chose not to conform. It's hard to not conform once. And he did it three times for our sakes. Can I tell you today that he has such a great purpose for you? But you need to be willing to step out and be separate. So we see that Jesus went from being separated as a baby and then he went to being in a crowd with others, a massive crowd. And then he went from that crowd to being lonely with the disciples. But finally, at the end of his life, he's still living in but at the end of when it got closer to the crucifixion, we see that Jesus was alone. Jesus was alone when his purpose took place. There was no crowds around him. In fact, we see that later in Matthew 26, Peter denied Jesus. His friend denied him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Three times his best friend. We could say his best friend. Huh? But his close friend. Amen? And then we see in Matthew 27, verses 17 through 18, it says, Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Verse 20 says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two of you do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas! Barabbas! Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified! Let him be crucified! Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. A crowd that was once saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! And praising him is now saying, Let him be crucified! Let him be crucified! Let him be destroyed! And Jesus was alone! Jesus was alone when the multitudes had turned on him. These are the same crowds that were once praising him, that were once with him. And now they shouted, let him be crucified. And all this after his friend Peter denied him. Jesus was truly alone. He was separated from the crowd. He had not been conformed. Jesus never conformed. We cannot conform. Amen? If you want to go greater in your purpose, if you want to go deeper with God, you can't conform. You cannot conform. Why? Because Jesus knew that there was a greater purpose. He knew that what he was going to do was going to change the course of our lives. 2,000 years later, it was going to change our lives. And now we have salvation because Jesus did not conform. He knew that there was a greater plan, a greater reason for his suffering. I wish somebody would praise God that had not conformed yet. Is there anyone who hasn't conformed yet to the patterns of this world? Is there anyone who says, not today, devil? I'm not going to conform to what you want me to conform to. Is there anyone? That says you can throw everything that you have at me. But I'm not going to give in. I'm going to keep coming to church. I'm going to keep praising God. I'm going to keep walking with Him. I'm going to keep going. Because my God is faithful. Hallelujah. We cannot conform. Keep your ministry going. The easiest thing to do is to conform. And I remember when I first started leading worship. When I first started leading worship here during the spike of the pandemic or COVID, whatever. 
And I started playing for the English service. It was very difficult to play and to sing. At the same time, amen, Brother Rafa. And it's, it's still not the easiest thing. I'm not saying that I'm a professional. I'm saying it was extremely difficult when I started. And I really was there trying to do my best. And so often I would look to my left while playing the piano at the congregation and the church would feel empty. The church would feel empty and there were very few. And there were very few even singing out of those very few with the worship team. And I would feel so discouraged after some of these services, amen? I'm being transparent with you all today. I would feel so discouraged. And I would ask, but why God? Why are there so few? But why God? Why is there a lack of fire? Why God? Why does it feel like we have to drag people off their feet to be here? But why God? And I was frustrated. I didn't want to lead worship anymore. It didn't feel worth it to me. It didn't feel worth it. There was nothing of product. It felt like there was no fruit. At least from what I could see. But we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? And I was so frustrated. But I was praying one day recently. And that thought came back to me. All those memories of how I used to feel. And God asked me, he said, will you worship me when you're alone? Will you worship me when you're the only one worshiping? Even in the crowd, will you worship me while they stay silent? Even in this church, will you worship me when no one else wants to? When it doesn't feel good to worship. When it doesn't feel productful to worship. Amen? We don't worship for our own feelings. We don't worship to feel something. We worship because He's worthy. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not here today to feel something good. I'm here because God is good. I'm not here for a greater feeling. I'm not here because I've been waiting all week to come and feel good. I'm here because God is worthy. And God asked me, will you worship me without a crowd? <laughs> will you worship me without a crowd? Will you worship me outside of youth camp? Will you worship me outside of a district service? Will you jump the same way you jumped when you were on fire? Will you jump when no one else is jumping? Will you praise God every time the same way? Or will you conform? to the way that they worship. <laughs> and God asked me that. And I broke down in tears. I realized that he needed to do something in me. He needed for me to be separate. Amen? Ministry is not an easy thing. And if you feel while ministering that there's no fruit, that there's no product, if you don't feel anything, keep going. Because God is doing something that you can't understand yet. If you don't feel anything yet, keep going and have that faith that it's producing something, amen? Keep going and have that realization that God has a greater purpose for your ministry than to feel good. Hallelujah. God has a greater purpose for your ministry than how other people feel. God's purpose is to save he is our comforter, yes. But He is my Savior before He is that. Even when I'm sad, I'm still going to worship. Hallelujah. Even when I don't feel comforted, I have salvation. When there was no one around to see, when there was no one around to applaud, God asked me, are you still going to worship? When there's no praise for you, and there's just praise for me, will you still worship? Or will you give in, God asked me. Will you stop and be comfortable again? If your ministry is becoming harder, and it seems like it doesn't amount to much, keep moving forward, amen? Brother Stephen, keep moving forward.
board. Amen. Your prayers, your prayers have kept the youth and have brought us to where it is. And I feel this in my spirit. I feel this in my spirit for Brother Stephen, for Pastor, for Brother Leo. Even when they were alone, they kept going. Even when it felt like it wasn't amounting to anything, he was still the youth pastor. He was still the pastor. He was still the assistant pastor. We need to thank God for the men of God in our lives that have pushed forward and not conformed. Hallelujah. You wouldn't be in the same place without them. You wouldn't be in the same place without them. And just as they have gone far, I also want to go far, but I need to be willing to not conform. I need to be willing to worship alone when there's no one around, when I don't want to worship, when it doesn't feel nice or good. You need to worship. You need to not conform. You need to go deeper and continue diving, hallelujah. There's a greater purpose. There's a greater reason. Am I speaking to anyone today? Hallelujah! Keep going! Keep going! As I finish, I want to finish with this word that God gave me. Because recently I, I, I finished a fast, and I, and I say this not out of self-glorification, but I say this because because I fasted, and before the fast, God was speaking to me and giving me words, and I was like, wow, this is amazing, this is amazing. And then I started the fast in silence. I didn't receive a word from God, but I thought, God, but I'm fasting. I didn't receive a word from God or a message from God. It felt like my fire was trying to be put out, but I said, God, I'm I'm fasting. I'm trying to get deeper with you. What happened to the messages? What happened? And, and I was expecting to hear the voice of God. I had eliminated distractions. I was focused on reading and I was praying. I was doing everything right. So I thought, but nothing much happened. There wasn't a word from God while I was fasting. And I thought, I'm not fasting for a word. Amen. I shouldn't be fasting to receive something. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm fasting because he's worthy. Amen. I'm fasting because I can't conform. And because I got to go deeper, amen? amen? Don't worship God out of the rewards that he can give you. Amen. What he's giving you should already be enough. And as it seemed like nothing was happening, I looked for a display of God's power. I looked to the sky to see an angel, but nothing. And I wanted to hear his voice, but it was awfully silent. And the silence made the fast tedious. <laughs> the silence made the fast feel like forever. Amen. And I wanted to give in. I wanted to give up. I wanted to conform. But I knew that there was a reason that I had been called to fast. And finally, when I ended the fast, when I broke it, I received a word from God that day. <laughs> that day I received a word from God. And he said, run. I thought, run? What? I fasted and that's what I get? No, I'm just kidding. I didn't. But I was still like, run? What does that mean? What does that mean? And he clarified and he said, run in your church. Run in your church until there's no room left to run. Run in your church until there's no room left to run. And I thought, how interesting is that? What does that mean, God? And God was telling me this. He said, you need to run until the church fills up and there's no room left to run. Amen. You need to run and you need to be separate. 
And what I didn't realize was that I had been asking God, is revival not your will? Do you not want the churches filled up? These are honest questions that I had for God. But you want all these people to be with you. Why does the church feel empty? But you want all this. Why is everything so hard? And he told me that that was the key to run. Run in the church until there's no room left to run. And even if I was the only person he was telling me to run, even if we are the only people in our services running, we must run. Even if we look like fools, we must run. Run until the church is so packed that you can't run anymore. Amen. It was a challenge. God said, you want to see your church packed? Show me. Show me how bad. Amen. Run. And this is, this is what God wants for his churches. He does want them to be filled. He does want them to be packed. But we are too comfortable to get to that point. We haven't done enough yet to get the churches to where God wants them to be. It's a sad truth. But he wants it so packed that there's no room left to run. And this was such a powerful commandment given to me by God. I started to think about the significance of running in the church. Running. Running. What happens? What happens? And I was trying to find what it meant. And God revealed it to me. He said, when you run in your church, you become a blade that I use. A blade that I use to cut the flesh off of the church. Yes, the church is all one body, but this church is also one body. This specific church, Sion Apostolic Church, is a body that has flesh. And he said, when you run, you become a weapon that I use to cut the flesh off of the body. In Jeremiah 51, verses 20 to 24, it says, You are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with you I will break the nation in pieces. With you I will destroy kingdoms. With you I will break in pieces the horse and its rider. With you I will break in pieces the chariot and its rider. With you also I will break in pieces man and woman. With you I will break in pieces old and young. With you, I will break in pieces the young man and the maiden. And verse 24 says, And I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for the evil they have done in, in Zion, in your sight, says the Lord. God showed this verse. It's no coincidence that it says in Zion. This is Zion. This is Sion. Amen? We must become weapons, yes. but we need to run. Yes. And this is why running is so necessary, hallelujah. You think you're too good to run. You think you're too tired to run. You think that the preacher's message isn't worth running for. Amen, I know that because I thought that. I thought, no, I'm not going to run for this one. I'll run for the next one. That preacher's better. Amen? No, it's not about who preaches. It's about who the word is from. It's about what God is trying to do. Yes, yes. We shouldn't run for a preacher. We should run for God. If you've ran before, we should run again. Because we must worship God. Pushing forward every time to give him a greater praise. If not an equal praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want my praise to be going up and down like this. I should be praising him, striving forward each time. If I jump in church, I want to jump in church every day. If I jump, if I run, hallelujah, I should keep on doing that, hallelujah. You think you're too tired, you think you're too good. You're wrong. We must run. We must become a blade that God uses. Why? Because when someone chooses to run to the church, they become the blade that cuts the flesh off. God wants to use someone who is willing. God wants to use someone as a blade who is willing to run. Amen? You want to see real change after a service? Run in that service. Amen? 
Don't let that pride get a hold of you. Don't worry about how you look. Don't worry about being embarrassed. Hallelujah. I would rather be embarrassed in front of my church than embarrassed in front of God. Hallelujah. I would rather be uncomfortable here than uncomfortable in hell. Hallelujah. I'm going to start running right now on the count of three. And I challenge you to run with me and become blades that God wants to use. Hallelujah. Don't you dare conform to what your brother or sister is doing next to you. Hallelujah. God is ready to lose something. God is ready to do something new in this church. But you have to want it. You can't conform. You have to show it. Can somebody shout for Jesus today? One, two, three. Run through the church. Run through the church. Hallelujah. Don't conform. Hallelujah. Become a blade and run through the church. Hallelujah. If you want God to do something new, run through it. Hallelujah. I don't want to sit down. I'm not willing. I'm not willing. Hallelujah. I'm going to do it. I'm going to not conform. Hallelujah. God is doing something new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. There's a greater purpose. There's a greater reason. Don't sin. and be conformed. Hallelujah. I don't want to be conformed. Hallelujah. I don't want to sit with the crowd of the church. I don't want to stay with the crowd of the church. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to go to where no one else is God. If you want Sion to be something new, then why don't you show God and do something new? Hallelujah. If you're from another church, Hallelujah. Why don't you show him what you wanted to do in your church? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I wish there was a minister that would run with us. I wish there was a minister that would run behind. Hallelujah. There's a reason. Don't conform. There's no music. There's no music. That doesn't matter. I don't need music to worship God. I don't need music to worship God and run. I don't need a praise break. Everything that I need is in Him, hallelujah. 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 Come on. Hallelujah. I thought this was an apostolic church. I thought this was an apostolic church. Let's give Him some apostolic praise. Hallelujah. This is not a quiet church. This is not a quiet church. This is not a quiet church. This is a Joshua and the battle of Jericho type of church. This is a shout and the walls come down type of church. This is an apostolic church. I don't want to be conformed. Hallelujah. You want to shout at your walls today. Shout at your walls. Hallelujah. If you want to see them gone quicker, you need to run a little quicker. Hallelujah. If you want to see a difference, you want to run. Hallelujah. There is praise that we have as a weapon. Hallelujah. It is warfare. Like I said, there is a war for this pulpit right here. You want to praise God? Show Him. Give Him a new praise. Hallelujah. As I conclude today, church. I want to say that God is a destination. There are different levels to go with Him. And the deeper you go, the less people are going to be around you. The deeper you go with God, the less people you're going to see next to you. Wait a second. What happened to my friends? They chose to stay up there. You're going deep. We're going deep. Hallelujah. The deeper you go, 
the less people you're going to see. Yes. And if you want to be in the deep things of God, then you need to praise a little differently. Yes. If you want to be in the deep things of God, you have to praise differently from everyone else. You're not going to get to a different place doing what they're doing. You're not going to get deeper with God if you act the same way that you've been acting. You need to change it up. You need to change it up. God is a destination, which means I have to keep moving forward and keep changing the way that I do things. Hallelujah. I need to stop conforming in everything that I do. You cannot be comfortable and conform. Hallelujah. Do not be conformed.